Much of my work at MIT has focused on precision cosmology. Precision cosmology, for many years, sounded kind of like a joke because you could get together with your friends and have some beer and you could speculate about the age of our universe and, and then you could go home because there was really not much else you could do than speculate. There was no data. When I was a graduate student, we still would argue about whether our universe was 10 billion years old or 20 billion years old. But now we argue about whether it's 13.7 billion years old or 13.8 billion years old. And I want to talk about what has changed, how an avalanche of high quality data of different sorts have, have transformed cosmology from being this very speculative area to being a real precision science. As a first example, of how technology has made this possible. Edwin Hubble, when he f first discovered the expansion of our universe in, in, during work in, in the 1920s, it, it took him we, several weeks of observations on one of the biggest telescopes of the time to, to map out the distances to about 30 galaxies. You know. Now, with a Sloan Digital Sky Survey that I've had the fortune to get to work with, we can do 640 galaxy distance measurements at the same time in one hour. So it becomes sort of industrial scale and you can, it becomes feasible then to start mapping out three-dimensional maps of the cosmos with a million galaxies or more. Another parallel revolution that's happened, again thanks to new technologies, is that the detectors in our cameras have just gotten dramatically better, more sensitive, and able to measure not just visible light, but all kinds of invisible frequencies like microwaves, infrared light, ultraviolet, and x-rays and gamma rays. And in, in, 19, in the 1960s, for the first time, the cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered. This is heat radiation left over from our Big Bang. And in 1992, when I was a graduate student, the COBE satellite for the first time managed to take some pictures, very fuzzy pictures of, the, of this, but still the first pictures, baby pictures of our universe, the way it looked when it was 400,000 years old. More recently, the NASA Wilkinson satellite took these much more spectacular images. And even more recently, the, your, the Planck satellite has made this beautiful 50 megapixel image of what our universe really looked like when, when it was only 400,000 years old. This combined with these three-dimensional galaxy maps and a variety of other observations have really transformed cosmology from being speculative to being very data-driven. And it's, it's enabled us to calculate really precisely things like how old our universe is, how big our universe is, exactly what it's made up of. For example, we know that our universe was very boring in its childhood. It was just a bunch of gas which is almost uniformly distributed, much like the air in this room here. But um, you can hear me now, which means that there are sound waves in this room. And if you measure the density at different places, it varies by about one thousandth of a percent, at the level of 10 to the minus 5, if you measure this far from my mouth. That's roughly how non-uniform the early universe was also, 10 to the minus 5 level fluctuations from place to place. What happens over time is the gravity amplifies these small sound waves, these fluctuations in the gas, and creates bigger and bigger clumps, galaxies, stars, planets, etc., and leaves us with this very, very rich and structured universe that we see today. And, and precision cosmology has succeeded to a great extent to measure this growth of clustering. The way we start is by looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation and looking at exactly how the universe was clumpy and clustered 400,000 years after our Big Bang. These 10 to the minus 5 level fluctuations. The sky is 10 to the minus 5 times hotter in some places, colder in other places. Then we can put this information into really big computers and try to predict how clumpy our universe will be later and when the first galaxies will form and what sort of patterns they will cluster in. Then we can compare this with what we actually see when we make these three-dimensional galaxy maps with our telescopes. And the result of this has been really quite remarkably successful. We, we have a, a theory which is known as the standard model of cosmology, which agrees very nicely with all of these measurements that we have. However, 
the model has a, a, a bunch of what we call free parameters, a few numbers that we have to put into it. And the model only agrees with the data if we put in the correct values of these numbers. One of the numbers is the density of atoms. Another one that tells you how much dark matter there is. Another parameter tells you how much dark energy there is. Another parameter tells you how clumpy the early universe was. Another parameter tells you the ratio of large to small clumps. It's quite remarkable that we've been able to, by, to take many, many, many uh, gigabytes of data and fit them all perfectly with just these six numbers. It's uh, the greatest triumph for precision cosmology so far. And, and this is the reason why we now can say with some confidence that we know that there is dark matter and there is dark energy and we know how much of it there is. But we mustn't become arrogant and think that our job is done because each one of these cosmological parameters is still mostly a, a way of parameterizing our ignorance. We know that there is dark matter, but we don't know what it is. We know that there is dark energy, but we don't know what it is. We know that there were these fluctuations in the early universe, but we're not quite sure what, what caused them. For example, dark matter, as far as we can tell, is a, is a substance which, which uh, can form clumps. There is a big clump of dark matter about the size of our galaxy. We know that it's there because the gravitational pull of the dark matter makes stars orbit around faster than they would otherwise because they feel the pull of it. But this dark matter is very different from the atoms that we are made out of. As far as we can tell, the dark matter particles, they don't like to interact with us very much. They fly right through this room as we speak, but they go right through my hand, out on the other side, they hit the ground, they go through Earth, go out on the other side. This might sound crazy, but there is, we've already discovered another particle called the neutrino, which behaves a lot like this. And neutrinos sometimes, if you build a big enough detector, can still be caught and studied. And there's a worldwide quest now to hunt the dark matter in the same way. And we might very well in a few years, for the first time, know what the dark matter is because we might catch some of these particles. Another possibility is we might produce dark matter particles at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Another approach <clears throat> which I'm very excited about is to make better maps of where the dark matter is in, the, in the space by looking at how galaxies are clustered and to learn more about dark matter that way. Dark energy behaves very differently. Dark energy does not, as far as we can tell, ever form clumps. Dark energy is a substance which is completely uniform and seems to fill all of space. It seems like it's almost a property of empty space. Whereas dark matter is our friend. Dark matter helps galaxies form by pulling them together with its gravity. Dark, ma dark energy is our enemy. It pushes things apart. So if there were more dark energy or less dark matter, we wouldn't be here because our galaxy wouldn't actually have formed in the first place. And um, if the dark energy stays around in our universe and doesn't decay away, then it's going to keep making our universe fly apart faster and faster in an accelerating fashion. This got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, this discovery. But we still don't know what dark energy is. And uh, figuring that out is so important because it's going to determine the whole future of our cosmos. And finally, maybe the biggest mystery of all is, okay, we live in this wonderful universe. We understand pretty well what it's been doing for the past 13.8 billion years. It's been expanding, getting bigger, getting colder, getting more interesting. But what started it? We don't know, but there is a very interesting theory, which is the most popular explanation in science for what caused it, known as inflation. And what this theory says is that if you have a very peculiar kind of substance, which is very hard to dilute and has the property that if you expand it into twice the volume, it keeps the same density. Then when you solve Einstein's equations of, of gravity, it, you predict that this substance will just keep doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. And we all know that if you double something very oh, many, many times, it becomes huge very quickly. And before long, this subatomic speck of stuff has become vastly larger than our entire universe. Because it was also doubling, it's flying apart very fast. So this explains why our universe is expanding. And in, in this effect, it explains what put the bang into our Big Bang. 
And it also predicts another truly remarkable thing, which is one of the most beautiful discoveries I feel in all of science. It predicts why we see these fluctuations, why our universe wasn't completely boring and uniform early on, why there were these seeds of structure which later could grow into galaxies. And the way it explains this is by saying that quantum mechanics, the supreme law for the subatomic world, has within it the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which prohibits things from being completely uniform. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics says you cannot have a universe which is completely uniform. There must be little fluctuations. But those fluctuations are on tiny scales, much smaller than atoms. So what do they ha possibly have to do with galaxies? Well, the beautiful idea is that inflation kept doubling this space. So these short, short distances where you had the quantum fluctuations get stretched out eventually to be larger than, than galaxies. And so what this theory predicts is that the fluctuations that ultimately led to the formation of the galaxies and us and everything else ultimately came from quantum mechanics, you know, from, from the micro world. And it's a beautiful connection between the very smallest scales of our universe and the largest scales of our universe. This works beautifully in, in quantitatively explaining all this. And there are some new experiments going on, which could, if we're lucky, provide the ultimate smoking gun evidence that this is actually true. I think the next step towards tackling these great mysteries of dark matter, dark energy, the origin of our universe, etc., is to make even bigger maps of our cosmos. So far, we've actually mapped only less than 1% of this volume. But there is a new technique which can enable us to map about 100 times more of the volume. Not by looking at galaxies anymore, but by just looking at the gas itself that fills space. This gas gives off radio waves. And by building new state-of-the-art radio telescopes, using a technique called 21 centimeter tomography, we can in principle make these incredible three-dimensional maps of much of our universe. And I, I think that's gonna be extremely exciting as the next step in cosmology, if we can manage to do it.